My name is Susan Reed and I've lived in Ashland for about 45 years, maybe a little longer. My husband and I graduated from Cal State Dominguez Hills, better known as the Watts Campus in Southern California. And part of our study was in neighborhoods and um, how neighborhoods decayed and were often uh, raised, were destroyed, and what that meant to communities. I, um, we discovered Ashland and we looked at the railroad district, which was at that time redlined by banks. They weren't loaning money and um, unless you tore down the structure and then built something new, usually a multiplex. And so we chose to move to Ashland and brought our two children, two young children, and I was pregnant with a third and had Sarah uh, when we moved here and we started in construction because we couldn't sell our college degrees. <laughs> it wasn't like we could just hand them over and somebody would pay us money for them. And I'd grown up in construction so Rod was willing to uh, work with some contractors, some builders and learn the trades and we ran a small company and we specialized in saving old homes in the railroad district. We'd call in the movers and we'd lift them up and put in a new foundation. We'd do new electrical and plumbing and make them available for money uh, from the bank. And in this small class at Cal State Dominguez Hills, there was another person that proved to be very important to the city of Ashland, John Friganesi, who came to us as a planner. He and Rod had graduated in a very small class in geography from Cal State. And he was able to bring money, federal money, to the railroad district. And Rod worked with a wonderful woman, Marjorie O'Hara, and um, put together uh, a historic district for the National Register of Historic Places. So that was kind of our beginning here. And we would move from house to house fixing up old houses. Uh, our youngest daughter said she lived in five houses by the time she started kindergarten. So um, that was kind of a picture of what we were doing. We had five elementary schools in the city of Ashland when I moved here. There are three now. And those families said, oh, we have kids, we want a backyard, we don't want to buy a condo. We're going to go to Medford or Talent or Phoenix. And so I think that we lost a certain percentage of our population just to the fact that the prices here for real estate are high, whether it's a small condo, a vacant lot, or a nice home. And I, I don't know that we can solve that. We didn't solve it in the 20 years I was on the council. I think we made inroads. I think we made some things better. And the possibility of, of uh, less expensive homes. But I, I don't know how you solve the problem. Early on, I was involved with schools in the sense that I had children in school. And I went to a school board meeting at the high school and I spoke out um, and challenged the board on some decision and after the meeting uh, a small group of people came up to me and asked me to run for city council which I had not at all thought about or planned but I realized in conversations and in reality and just the reality of taking my kids to Medford to do parks and rec and to take swimming lessons that although Ashen was very good about putting parks together for tourists, for visitors, and we were very good at looking at our business community and trying to enrich it because it had fallen on hard times in the early 70s. We weren't spending a lot of time as a community for families, for putting things together for families. And I took that as my lead to run for the city council. One of the things I enjoyed about uh, running for city council was walking the neighborhoods. And I would talk to people in their homes. I mean, I was only bitten by a dog once and um, only saw something that seemed very private that I shouldn't see once. Um, but most of the time, I would see people in their, their yards. I tried to walk at a time when people would be out 
watering or working in their garden. And I, I tried not to walk right at dinner time, but when people got home from work and uh, I had great conversations with people and learned things about different blocks in the city that I would not have, have known. And some of the people, and I think with reason, felt that they, the city council wasn't open to them. It wasn't available for them to approach or to, uh, or that no one was listening to them. And so being in their front yard with them gave them a chance to tell me things that I don't think I would otherwise have heard. And, and that made a difference to me. One of the criticisms uh, or compliments that I received uh, was one, I didn't know how to hold a grudge, and two, that um, I would change my mind <laughs> during, and it was true, because sometimes we'd have testimony, and I would think, well, this really conflicts with what I've read and understood before, so I have to back off this decision, at least for now, or sometimes make a different decision. And for some council members who had come to a conclusion before the meeting started, that was very difficult because, uh, you know, but I, I enjoyed it. <laughs> On that ballot, Ashen became the first nuclear free zone by a vote of its people. So two things were happening to me, for me. One was my work trying to look at issues that involved families and children. And the second one was taking pride in our nuclear free zone. I'm going to just say that my time on the city council for 20 years, um, I was really started on the council in November of 81, as soon as the election was over, and <clears throat> to 02, so for 20 years. And that's bookend with <clears throat> work having to do with schools. So Lower Walker Street, in front of what is now the middle school, and was then the junior high school, was a dirt road. And we had a son who was running track, and we could see the dust from Granite Street just cover the track as these kids were working out. And that's not good for their lungs. And I came to the city as a new counselor and said, we need to, we need to pave Lower Walker. And they said, oh, you're just naive because Lower Walker is in the city. It's a county road. The school district is on one side and the state college on the other. So you have four governmental entities and we just, it's too complex. We can't go ahead with this. So I asked Dr. Farquhar, who was then a pediatrician in Medford and his nurse to come and testify to the city council. We weren't on television, but we were on radio. And I think that it helped that the council members and the city staff knew that, that their words were going out to the general community. And their words were that this was very dangerous for the kids to be inhaling that small particles of glass. And in a very short time, Lower Walker was paved. And I was very happy. I was very happy. And I'll just jump to the bookend, the other end of the 20 years. Um, by then, I had a granddaughter attending Bellevue Elementary School. And what I realized about Bellevue Elementary School when I went to pick up Rasia was that some of the kids that lived on Upper Tolman Creek or in the Green Meadows and the nicer neighborhoods in the Upper Tolman Creek, their parents were picking them up in cars. But half of the kids or more were walking down Tolman Creek to the other side of Ashland Street. They lived in apartments and uh, smaller homes. And their parents probably were working because they were walking down a street that only had ditches on each side. So to get out of the way of a car, they literally had to get into a ditch. There were some little paths that went along by the ditch. And I said, we have to, we have to put sidewalks in because the kids that are walking down a busy street, and Tolman Creek is a busy street, need to be able to walk on sidewalks. And so that was really my last big project, and it was actually completed after I left the city council. But I like to think that my time on the council was bookend by these two, these two things. Um, 
The city of Ashton is very lucky to be an electric utility, to be buying wholesale from Bonneville. In a sense, it's not just the college and our wonderful theater, OSF, but it's our electric utility that makes the city of Ashland different from other smaller cities in Oregon. We can take the profits from that and reinvest them in our city. So it's not like an investor-owned utility where the profits go somewhere else. The profits from the electric utility stay here in Ashland. And <laughs> having that utility provided it an opportunity for me to get involved in energy work. Um, literally, the um, Bonneville Power Authority. Bonneville Power Authority is the entity that the city buys from. And because we had some <clears throat> wonderful staff members here and were able to develop a conservation and energy work, Bonneville used Ashland kind of as a beta project to um, to try things out on. Dick Wonderscheid, who uh, has recently retired um, from Bonneville Environmental Foundation, was able to put together many of these projects for Bonneville here in Ashland. And as a council member, I got to take part. So it was very um, instrumental for me to learn uh, not about, just about electric utilities, but about the conservation that was possible. And and how Ashland could really be a model for other cities. And this um, allowed me, I was asked to uh, chair the Energy Advisory Committee for the League of Oregon Cities and the Association of Oregon Counties, which I did for more than 15 years. And we worked as small cities and large cities um, and tried to move in a, in a direction that conserved energy and we fought the takeover of um, Bonneville um, many times. <laughs> for, uh, and um, actually Scottish Power tried to come into Oregon and it was that committee and those um, leaders from the different communities that could turn away Scottish Power, a big um, mega utility that wanted into Oregon, wanted to elbow their way in. So that was a wonderful experience. I was asked then to represent Oregon cities to the Bonneville Power Association, which I did for eight years on their consultation team, which took me to Washington and Idaho and Western Montana, as well as all of Oregon. And at that same time, I was asked to be a board member for the League of Oregon Cities, which proved to be very rewarding. It was a time when Republicans and Democrats worked together to figure things out, to move ahead. And it was, um, it was really important to, to know what smaller cities in Oregon were facing and how that differed from some of the larger cities and to sit with people and try to work things out. Um, I thought it was uh, a very rewarding time for me and I hope and think that um, there was uh, good work for the, for the state of Oregon and a bigger community. Uh, some of the things I did in the city of, of Ashland led to other things and one of the early things I did was a project called Ed's Trains. And there was a man who grew up here in Ashland who loved trains to the point that he wanted to have his own caboose and cars and he, as I say, he'd grown up here. So there were some members of actually the Ashland Public Works that helped the man that they'd gone to school with. Ed um, had some learning disabilities and it took um, help. He needed help from his friends to move these trains onto his property. Of course, moving these trains onto his property above Gresham um, was uh, not pleasing to the neighbors. And they were very concerned about it. And it was my introduction to mediation which I then studied and worked under Kate Geary and mediated for Jackson County. But my first meeting with Ed and the neighbors, we sat around a table and I was determined to have everyone speak, even the people that were reluctant and not allow the people that wanted to take over to take over. So it was really one of my first times that I didn't have a gavel. I think I had a spoon and I had a clock and I tried to make it so everyone would speak. But it, 
it really showed me that you can come to a conclusion that benefits the whole community. Um, Ed uh, was later died, and I don't think that his death has been resolved. But um, it was a wonderful experience to, to kind of enter into mediation as a, as a workplace. And as I say, I, I enjoyed my work in mediation. Ed's home was burned and he, and he was found dead. He was murdered and the, the murder was not resolved, in my understanding. And I think the trains were then removed, probably by the same men that had taken them up to Ed. As I say, Ed was the nice kid in school that was a little bit slower than some of them and um, they always kind of took care of Ed. And um, the same thing about his trains, he would want, and he would buy some caboose someplace, and then he'd get the old timers on the city um, public works with the heavy equipment to move the train up to his backyard in the alley behind Gresham. And um, <laughs> it, it, it was wonderful. <laughs> it was both wonderful and problematic but we did resolve it and he promised not to get any more trains and that was the that was the <laughs> the answer to our our meeting <laughs> so much was given to me through the city and, and being a member of the city council um, when i was on the city council uh, i was one of three women on the council uh, pat ackland and karen or karen sue smith and myself and I think that when women, uh, when women get together, we're often willing to talk things out. We are willing to share more. And I think that it changed the complexion of the council because we came together, not always in agreement, but willing to talk about how we might move forward. And I'm not trying to exclude men either. Phil Arnold, Don Laws, certainly Greg Williams, who ran against me in a race and then was seated next to me on the council. You know, coming from different, I was probably more progressive, Greg a wonderful businessman, you know, more the Republican, I'm more the Democrat. But we saw the goal and we worked together to get there, to get to, to what was best for our community. And I thought that that was a very um, important um, element for the city of Ashland, to have a council that was goal oriented was listening to the community. We hadn't made up our mind, but we were listening to testimony and then moving forward. And that was, uh, that was a wonderful time to work with the people on the council. And of course, the council changes. The city and the university had a great, uh, of course then it was the college, but, <laughs> but our parks and rec um, worked with them. and took over some of the fields and expanded softball, which was important in our family. Um, so in taking, in, 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 so the state or the college um, saved money by having our parks and rec go in and take care of some of the fields. And then it provided both for the college and for the community. I thought that was a great idea. Of course, at the time there was a swimming pool at the college. And when that was lost and they chose not to replace it, that was a loss for our community. Um, we've expanded the YMCA and that's been very important. But at the time when you lose the only deep pool, the only deep pool, the pool that you can play water polo in. I mean, we had a water polo um, team at our high school with no pool. I mean, you can't play water polo in four feet. It just doesn't work. <laughs> so we still have some places to go to expand for families here in Ashland, but we have lost families too in the last 40 years. So it's very, um, it's hard. It's hard. You were on city council when that whole North Campus... John Friganesi played a role there too. He didn't want them to be all identical. You, you know, he wanted little roof lines and staggering and just uh, a, a more interesting um, complex. And I thought that that was important. I think that the the university is really a very important part of our community. It really, in the early 70s when Ashland was in such dire straits, I'm going to say every third or fourth store was closed in downtown. So to have 
the college then have jobs that were living wage and encouraging people to move here and raise their families here was very important. Um, and of course the students themselves are very important to the community too because they come out in the community and buy things and and go out to eat and and so that's been very important. Um, the expansion of OSF and I'm talking during a pandemic which has closed things down tremendously but we're going to be on the other side of this and those entities will come back and enrich our city because they have in the past and that's what enriched our city in the early 70s and um, I, I'm sure that we're going we're gonna to come back out of this but we're very lucky to be an electric utility. I'm just going to go back there because I can't tell you on the board of Oregon, the League of Oregon Cities, how many cities just you know, the lumber mill would close and they pretty much closed down their community. Or, you know, some entity would close, something would move and their community would be gone. But because we can keep that money from the, our electric utility and because we have the university and we have this theater, we're a very fortunate city. We're located in a beautiful place. We have a beautiful location and backdrop. So that brings people here too. Rod, Rod and I were in uh, the lodging business. We had a very small lodging business for 30 years. Um, we went from construction to, um, Rod lectured at the college for eight years in history and um, worked there and we had this little lodging business. So we've had to find various ways to have an income to support our family to live here. I went back to school and um, got a master's in sociology. It was actually an interdisciplinary, but I wrote about women who packed pears. And so I have this wonderful. This poem is called Pretty Packs, and I wrote this in the car after packing on the, on the floor at SOS. Pears wrapped securely in white paper, neat diagonal lines rows of pretty pears, aspirins at three, thermoses filled with coffee, laced coffee, the coke machine 30 cents, another coke, another break from a two-hour race. How fast, how many boxes, 37 cents a box, $50 a day, $60 a day, more pain, more aspirin, more medical notes, more medicine at night, a note from a doctor, cortisone shots, another day, how long will the season last? Thank you. The women that packed pears were just tremendous. I, I wrote poetry and a friend did some wonderful photography and it was a project that we were able to celebrate these traditional roles of women's work because women have packed pears and in Jackson County since World War I. Um, and it's changed, but I was able to get in at a time in the 80s when the old houses were still up and some two or three generation of women would be pair packing. And it was, uh, it was tough work, uh, competitive work, but I really enjoyed working in, in that arena with these women, with pairs coming down these chutes and going into bins and turning around and um, we had to pack a certain weight in a box and a certain diagonal pattern with tissue paper and uh, the women would tell great stories, wonderful stories um, and that was a gift to me to, to work there. It was my most embarrassing moment as a packer. We were packing out Bosque pears before a fruit change the middle bins were running full, but there were no large or small fruit for either the head or the foot of the line to pack. Most packers were sitting on steel roller belts between the lines. I was working foot and had come up to the middle to find fruit. Jenna, a packer with 20 years experience, had never spoken to me before. She gave me a hard look and said, who are you? She continued to pack and refused to move up to the bin to allow me a space to park my packing horse and pack. I answered, Susan Reed. She asked again, who are you? I realized everyone on the belt was watching and listening for my answer. 
Again, I said, Susan Reed. Jenna turned her back on me and continued packing. I knew I had a right to the pears. Jenna was second to head. Therefore, I had a priority to pack before she packed. Time seemed to stand still before I realized that my answer to her question, who are you, should have been, I'm the foot. <laughs> so being on the Ashland City Council kind of opened new doors and allowed me to move in, into new directions. I mean, there were so many wonderful people that I worked with, Jill Turner, uh, City Finance Director, Dick Wonderscheid, who worked in several different uh, arenas, but I consider him kind of the leader of conservation for the city of Ashland. Uh, Paul Nolte, we had a wonderful uh, city attorney that was the kind of man that you could walk up to and tell him your idea, and he would say, nice idea, it's not going to work, and these are the reasons, <laughs> or I'll support you in that, and this is how we'll move forward. So uh, we had a dynamic mayor for 12 years, Kathy Golden Shaw, and um, it was fun to work with her. I think that Kathy ran a very dynamic campaign, and she is a wonderful campaigner, wonderful campaigner. And so, um, and she had a lot of ideas and modernized the city in ways. John Friganesi, I always credit him with putting the city into computers. I mean, literally, I think our finance department was using pencils and ledgers, but um, between the two, between Kathy and John Friganesi, and Brian Omquist then as administrator, being a little bit more old school, a little bit more reluctant, but willing to see the future and move forward with it. That was a, that was a wonderful time. Um, that was a wonderful time. As I say, we didn't always agree, but I think we always worked towards the best solution for the, for the community. We only crossed swords kind of at the end, and that was uh, over a wastewater treatment plant. So our wastewater treatment plant is, uh, is very high tech. People came from all over the world to see it when it was completed. And my argument in favor of holding on to the water that we'd used and cleaning it and returning it to the creek was just something I'd learned as a child. When you borrow something, you return it in better shape than when you had when you borrowed it. You know, you, run, you, you take a car from a friend and you wash it and you fill the gas tank and then you return it. That's the way, that's the way you're supposed to do it. That was just what I'd learned as a child and practiced. And, and we could not take the water and then dispose of it as if it had no value. One, we might need to use it again, but two, it had value to the creek, and not just to fish, but of everyone downstream. And it was a big project, and it was very divisive in the city, and to be on the other side of an argument with Kathy was a difficult place to be. She's a very dynamic person. She's the person you always want on your side. But I'm very proud of the city moving forward with that project, because I think that, one, it allows us to reuse the water if we need it. But we're treating the water as if it has value. And of course, in the 21st century, which we are now well into, water is the gold of the 21st century. Water is so important. So I'm happy to have been part of that project. Um, I think it's a good change, and I'm looking forward to it. Because I think what's happened is that we've, as I say, Kathy Golden Shaw was a dynamic mayor trying to modernize the city. And so she worked with the administrator and had goals. But I think that in the last few years, I have to say I was very disappointed that we didn't have um, a professional city administrator. Adam Hanks has grown up through the ranks, and I think he does a good job. So it's not Adam Hanks. But it's just you know having a fire chief who might be a wonderful person trying to manage a city. We, we not only have the electric utility, we own the cemeteries. We have the graveyards, we have the water, we have the streets, we, you know, we have it all. We, we have a very complicated system. And to ask somebody that is a great fire chief to take that over isn't fair. And I think that having the mayor, who is not a, a professional, in charge of that is wrong. And I think that the step that the city took to put professional management in place was a good step, and I expect good things from it. Um, I think we need a, 
a licensed engineer in public works. I think we need a professional in, um, in the seat of city administrator. Uh, those are very important roles. One of the things that I learned, the city of Ashland loves to have Parks and Rec as a separate entity. They have their own budget, they're the separate entity. But as the attorney for the League of Oregon explained to me and council members at the time I was on the council, we could elect every board we wanted to. We could have a wastewater board, a street board, we could have as many. The city council is the only entity that's in charge of the budget. The city council has to take full responsibility for every decision Parks and Rec makes. And that's been difficult because people kind of want to push off difficult things to someone else. And it's, oh, it's their problem, it's not my problem. And that happened with our senior center and I was very, very sad to see that happen and go through that because we're one community. To think that our wonderful community center that John Ferganesi brought funds to, to, to rebuild didn't have a maintenance budget and has fallen into disrepair after being completely renovated. Okay, it's been 30, 35 years ago, whatever, but if we'd had a maintenance budget in place, people would still be playing cards and dancing there today and having their wedding receptions, which our oldest daughter's wedding reception was there and it was great, it was wonderful. <laughs> she was married in the park across the street. We walked across the bridge and had the reception in the community center. And that's what I think is wonderful about Ashland that we can really, mm, really use the facilities here and that the the people feel like it's theirs that the community center is their community center and I was really disappointed to see it fall into disrepair. One of the things that I learned was working across the table with people that came to the table with different ideas and I, I can say Republicans and Democrats or especially in this very divided time it's so important to be able to sit at the table and work things out. Um, and, and we did do that, um, and I think that Oregon is pretty um, famous for having uh, Republicans who were conservationists that cared about the river. And people here in Ashland, they were worried about the budget, but they were wanted to spend money on parks and recreation and have places for the children to, to be, to, to, to recreate. And, to take care of the community, at a, the larger community. I think that that's really important and I enjoyed doing that with women and with men and with Democrats and with Republicans and trying to, to find the answer, to move forward together. Um, that, was, that was really important to me. Being on the council opened all these doors for me, whether uh, it was travel, to, to, to be on this wonderful um, trip to England and Wales, uh, or <coughs> mediation, or working at, for Bonneville, representing cities in Ashland, I mean in Oregon. These were all really important gifts to me, and I enjoyed doing it. There are so many things about the city that I really take pride in, and still live here and feel, feel pride in, in the city. So I have, there are three generations of our family now here in the city, and um, I'm, I'm very happy to have lived in Ashland these years and to work and to be part of the city.